So we'll go straight into the business. So we'll go for the sederant and intimation of apologies. Lynn. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, as usual, if you could keep your microphones on mute, please, and only on mute your microphone when you wish to ask a question. In terms of the sederant this morning, members, if you could unmute your microphone and confirm your attendance when your name is called, please. Councillor Roberts. Yep. We have an apology this morning from Councillor Jenkins. Councillor Friel. Yes, Lynn, I'm here. Thank you. We have an apology this morning also from Councillor McFadgen. Councillor Mackay. Present, Lynn. Councillor Cook. Yes, here, Lynn. We have an apology also from Councillor Maitland. Councillor Todd. Yes, here. Councillor Mayer. Here. Councillor McGee. Sorry, here. Councillor Crawford. Yeah. Councillor Bell. Here. And we have also an apology this morning from Councillor Filson. In terms of officers attending this morning, members from the planning service, we have David Wilson, Craig Thomas and Graham Mitchell. For governance, we have myself, Craig Young and David Mitchell. And we should have Care Chalmers from Ayrshire Roads Alliance. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks very much for that, Lynn. Uh, item one on the agenda is the uh, exclusion of public. I would so move. Members, are you happy with that? Great, great. OK, thanks very much. Item two is uh, any declarations of interest. Um, if any member has any declaration of interest, can you make it known at this point and what the nature of that interest would be? Members? Nope, I'm not seeing anything. OK. Um, on to the agenda proper. Um, item three is planning application number 21 0005 PP. Application for alteration of parking layout in relation to previously approved parking layout retrospective at land at former school site A719 from C127 Ash Yard to A76 at Crossroads Golson, East Ayrshire by Crossroads Community Trust. Pages 4 through 40. Craig. Yes. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Um, this planning application uh, before you today, uh, because as per the scheme of delegation, the application has attracted more than 10 objections. The application site is located at crossroads um, at the junction with the A76 and A719, and is currently an ongoing development site for the community hub building, which at this point in time is largely complete and operational. The site, as you know, is the former Crossroads Primary School, which was demolished in 2010. Immediately to the west of the application site are the residential dwellings of the Crossroads Hamlet with the A76 beyond. To the south and east are agricultural fields. To the north across the A719 is Woodhead Cottage with ag agricultural fields beyond. The application site is located within rural diversification area. Uh, within the East Ayrshire Local Development Plan 2017. Um, and members will note that starting at paragraph four of the papers, the lengthy background and planning history to this development, um, this current planning application proposes to alter the parking layout in relation to the previously approved layout, um, and the application is retrospective. Um, the agent has indicated also that there is additional paving added to the rear of the community hub building um, at the request of um, building standards to comply with building regulations for fire safety and egress. Uh, the uh, alterations to the car park um, include, as originally it was 75 spaces, which included 15 overspill spaces. And the proposal currently before you is to revise the parking layout to a total of 45 car parking spaces which includes four accessible spaces. The overspill parking area originally approved on the eastern side of the building has been removed from this proposal. Um, therefore, essentially, the proposal will, res will result in the loss of 30 car parking spaces. 
It is noted um, within the new parking layout that only three parking spaces are proposed along the western boundary, which face onto those existing dwellings within the crossroads hamlet. Um, which represents a reduction of 12 spaces along that boundary. Uh, the, land, uh, the agent has submitted a landscaping plan with the application to reflect the revised layout, which shows additional tree planting along the north and southern and western boundaries. They also propose a number of fruit trees um, around the application site. And the, the landscape plan also shows garden beds um, and the agent has indicated that the Woodlands Trust will be donating 440 saplings to be planted within the site. The landscape plan shows the erection of a new timber 1.8 metre high fence adjacent to the side and rear common boundary of the property known as Crossroads Cottage. The intent of this uh, new fencing is to assist in improving residential amenity by limiting levels of overlooking from the application site. It is noted that the applicant has indicated that to improve levels of privacy further um, that they will increase the height of that fence up to two meters um, i'll now refer you to some slides which will help give a better understanding of the site and I'll just share my screen is that working no can you see that? No. Let me go back to. No. Yeah. On the teams. Clicking on that. Is that working? Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. So the first slide there, you can see the application site. It's a larger uh, location plan. The application site there is within the red line circle there. Uh, you can see the A76 uh, to the west, um, which goes in a northerly direction up to Hilford and Kilmarnock. Um, to the south, you go to Mocklin. Um, you have the A719, you can see going to the east, which takes you into Galston. Uh, the next uh, slide here is a, another location site, site plan. You can see the application site outlined in red and the hamlets of residential dwellings at crossroads there on the western boundary. And access to the site is off the A719 to the north there. This is the uh, site plan submitted with this current application showing the revised parking layout. Yeah, the crossroads buildings there, I presume you can see my, my mouse there in the southern part of the site. Uh, you have the residential existing dwellings there to the west. Um, you can see the pathway system uh, shaded beige um, around the building. Yeah. These next slides, the slide on the left is the original planning uh, site plan approved under application 15422PP. Um, you can see the parking layout there, which had a row, a row along the western boundary, two internal rows, uh, and then a row to the east. Uh, you can see a large uh, hard paved area in front of the building, which was to be used for delivery, servicing, and, and actually uh, stalls, store holders. So there was quite a bit of pedestrian and vehicle access in that area. Uh, there was an NMV lodge to vary the, the application in 2018. That was is shown on the slide there, the plan on the right. That reference was 18008 NMV. Uh, that changed uh, the car parking area still stayed the same. Uh, that NMV changed fenestration, some minor um, landscaping, and you can see that the um, hard stand area in the front of the building was significantly reduced to provide just a single pathway with an access up to the western 
boundary where the, the, there's an access road there which can link up with a, a bus stop on that access road. Um, the next slide shows the current site plan on the left and the NMV which I was just talking about there on the right. You can see the revisions to the parking layout compared with that NMV and the original planning application. Um, as, as, you, as this report shows, the car parking has been significantly reduced um, and the, you can compare the layouts there. The pathway, as I mentioned, that was approved under the NMV up to the um, access road on the western boundary is evident. There's increased landscaping um, between the community hub building and the properties uh, at crossroads and there's increased landscaping to the west of the car park. That is just a landscape plan submitted with this current application, which is essentially the same as the site plan. You can see the additional planting along the boundaries, the green uh, blocks, um, which should help to improve the visual amenity of the development. There, this is a topography plan. Essentially, the site slopes from the south. Uh, west up to, or down to the northeast um, and it slopes approximately five meters over the length of the site. Uh, this is the map from the local development plan. The circle shows the location of the, the application site relative to the, the wider authority there. Um, the, this is the start of the site photos. The, the first few relate to essentially to um, the amenity impact on uh, the property known as Crossroads Cottage, which is the the end property in that, which adjoins the the row of dwellings, which adjoins the application site. That's taken from the driveway of that property, looking towards the A76. The community hub site is on the left, um, and that pathway I was talking about, which has raised concerns from the, particularly this resident, is uh, on the left of uh, this that photo. The next one is again taken from the driveway and it's looking into the crossroad site. Um, you can see an officer standing on that pathway um, projecting a little bit above the, the height of that existing fence. I don't know if you can see him where my arrow is there. And um, we have a measuring stick also um, set up which will give an indication. The next slide will show it clearly. So the height of that fence is 1.7 metres. The officer is standing on that path behind the measuring stick and the two metre uh, height is where the, uh, the measuring stick changes from the green to the black. So that's the, the two metre point. So going back to that slide, the two metre point is roughly where that the measuring stick uh, hits that branch of the tree is level with that. So. The applicant is proposing a two metre height. Well, well originally 1.8 and they have agreed to raise it to two metres and the fence will go along that, that boundary. So that will assist in uh, minimising any privacy and overlooking issues. The next slide is taken from the crossroads site, which is showing uh, just levels of soil disturbance and showing height levels. The, the path has been raised slightly to link up with the height of that to get the access from the community hub building up to the um, site boundary. Um, and there has been some land raising to get the correct gradient. Um, again, that's taken from the site looking towards the community hub building. You can see the pathway there rising. Um, I'll just quickly go through them. It's Oops. Again, that's showing standing on the path. The A76 there is in the, the background. You have existing hedging. Um, that's going around the same spot, looking closer towards the community hub building. Yeah. Here we have the community hub building with the pathway. And that's facing onto that adjoining property. That's the bin story of the community hub and you have significant vegetation hedging along that boundary 
um, with the adjoining property at Crossroads Cottage. Again, that's a detached garden, a uh, garage in the rear garden of Crossroads Cottage showing uh, the view from the Crossroads building at that point. Um, so you, it, that, there is significant uh, boundary treatment screening, as you can see, that there will be that two metre high fence going across essentially from that uh, bin store across that part of the site. Uh, again, that's looking further towards the, the dwelling house itself. Um, again, there will be that two metre high fence in that location. Uh, yeah, that's the, an end view of the, the um, Crossroads building looking up the, towards the A76, which shows the gradient of the, the natural gradient of the land uh, and this natural slope. This is an old photograph taken before uh, development commenced on site, which you can see that's looking, standing essentially where the new building is, looking towards the A76. And, and it show, that just highlights the natural gradient of the land, um, which hasn't significantly changed. Again, that's looking towards the A76, showing land disturbance in the pathway there. And that's a good shot showing the side of the the um, community hub building and that pathway, which, as I said, has been approved in that um, location. Uh, it's showing the gradient up to the, the rise up to the road. And the, the crossroads um, dwelling house uh, is there in the left behind the, the vegetation there. Uh, that's another, um, you can see the crossroads dwelling house there. There's another old photo which just shows the extent of the the, the land slope and the gradient. Um, these photos are taken from the property itself at um, Crossroads Cottage, looking onto the parking area and, and looking through the vegetation. And they're, they're the three car parking spaces looking from Crossroads Cottage. Previously, there was 15 spaces along that boundary and now there's only going to be uh, three and again two meter high fencing is proposed between the, the boundary of the residential property and that car park so there will be significant screening in the form of that fence. This photo is taken from the, the crossroads building looking down towards the access and the A719 and um, it shows the, the new parking layout, the screen boundary treatment, the hedging and the vegetation along the, the western boundary. Um, again, another photo slowly turning to the east. That's a rear elevation of the, the community hub building, showing the paved areas, planting. Again, the rear of the building, showing the boundaries with vegetation and the agricultural land beyond. That's swinging around. Again, swinging around, showing the car park areas. It just gives you an idea of the, the site itself and the parking. You can see all the new sapling tree plants planting along the boundary there. And, and that's the Rainbow Cottage at the end um, where objections were raised in regard to privacy and overlooking. Um, but that's the old photo standing in the, essentially the same spot. So there hasn't been significant change when you, you know, make comparisons between the two. And again, that's an old photo looking towards the residential properties. Uh, at crossroads, showing the topography and the slope of the land and what was existing prior to the development. It's looking up, essentially the new building is, that's looking towards where the new crossroads building would be. Uh, that's the end uh, property at crossroads cottage. Again, it shows the, gives you an idea of the slope of the land. It's just showing the uh, boundary treatment. Uh, the new parking, there has been land raising be between the crossroads cottage and the new parking, but it's not to a significant amount. Um, 
skin that's looking. You can see on this photo, the light um, tarmac area is the old um, access and paving. So that um, paving tarmac area, so that's been retained and the new um, tarmac area has tied in with that. And that's the darker, obviously the darker colored tarmac. So that they've tied in the level of the parking area with the old, so that's been essentially retained. Again, that's the old access parking showing the at the rear of the residential properties. Again, that shows the tie-in with the old and the new and shows the slope up to the community building with the new parking area. Again, the tie-in with the old and the new. again shows the, the foreground is the old tarmac area with the new in the, the, the second third and that's the existing and the new again and that shows the old before development you can see the level of the lands um, doesn't change significantly there's the the old curbing which you can see in that photo there is I mean, the height of the ground in that area has only been raised the height of a curb, so there isn't any significant um, land raising in that area. So you can see the, the land is essentially at similar levels to existing in that part of the site. Um, so that's the end of my slideshow. Um, I shall turn that camera on. Is that right now? Yeah, I'll just finish my uh, presentation here. Turning back to, oh, we have no objections to the consultees comprising Transport Scotland who were consulted due to the proximity of the site to the A76, which is a trunk road, the Issue Roads Alliance and the Inclusive Design Officer. Um, turning back to the report, there were 14 individuals who have objected to the planning application. The points comprise material planning considerations and in some instances non-material planning considerations which are noted within the report. The material planning considerations essentially relate to parking, the loss of the spaces, uh, the impact on residents from that, um, lack of sustainable travel um, to the location which because of the lack of um, the reduction in parking means more cars um, representing a health and safety issue queries relative to overspill parking and the loss of that feature um, and whether there will be a parking attendant given there will be a reduction in parking spaces. Um, travel safety issues were raised um, with cars reversing onto the A79 because the car park will be full. Um, landscaping um, impact uh, less aesthetically pleasing, ongoing concerns regarding tree removal. Um, reference was made to a smoking shelter and reference on the plans to future development of the site. Um, as the report states, that smoking shelter was um, indicated on plans for future development, but the application has removed that aspect. Uh, there were concerns regarding residential amenity um, impact on the hamlet, uh, the nature of the application being retrospective and queries regarding future applications. Uh, the Town and Country uh, Scotland Act 1997 as amended requires that applications are determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The development plan comprises the adopted East Ayrshire Local Development Plan 2017 and the Minerals Local Development Plan 13th of Jan 2020. In this instance, the adopted East Ayrshire, East Ayrshire Local Plan 2017 contains the relevant policies given the subject matter of the application. The application is considered to be compliant with the local plan overarching policy OP1, as well as Res 11, IND3 and T1. Therefore, given the terms of section 25 and 37 2 of the Town and Country Planning Act as amended, the application should be approved unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Material considerations are noted and the application is considered to be appropriate to the provisions of the local development plan and is not considered to have an unacceptable adverse impact 
on the residential amenity or on the general amenity of the area. The letters of objection, whilst noted, do not warrant refusal of the application. Consultees are satisfied with the proposal, whilst the planning history demonstrates that the established principle of the community hub development um, has been established. Taking account of the points discussed above, it is concluded that the proposal is in accordance with the adopted East Ayrshire Local Development Plan 2017. The application is therefore respectfully recommended to members for approval with the conditions specified in Appendix 1 of the report. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that, Craig. You put a lot into that presentation. Um, I think a lot of the a lot of the detail in here um, it relates to parking, roads, etc. Care, have you got anything you want to supplement before I throw it open to members for any points or queries they have in regard to the report? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, members. Um, yes, um, we, we've undertaken a fresh review of the parking requirements for the, the Crossroads Hub and members will note um, that this is all set out in paragraph 23 of the report starting on page 7. Um, and we've, we've undertaken this review with reference to the parking standards contained within uh, the Roads Development Guide. Um, and the most appropriate class use to apply for a development such as this is, is for social clubs, function rooms, cafes and restaurants. And uh, the parking standards calculations are, are based on the float area of, of a development. And you can see the actual calculations that we've undertaken in paragraph 23. Now, it, it's actually worth noting that the original proposed parking level was actually substantially greater than the calculated requirement which was 49 spaces based on the the um, the, the floor space um, from the original 2015 application. Um, now, what, so what, whilst there, there has been a, a substantial reduction in the number of parking spaces on the site, um, the, 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 the original number was actually um, a good bit in excess of what the, the parking standards were at that time. Um, and it's also worth noting the current building now has a reduced floor area um, compared with the 2015 application. So if we apply the, the development guide parking standards to the current floor area, um, the calculation shows that the appropriate parking provision would be 40 spaces, which is, um, and so there's, there's 45 now proposed, which five more than, than the, the parking uh, standards. So, uh, on that basis, uh, you know, we we were content that the parking standard uh, has been met. Um, however, um, we, in order to look at a worst case scenario, um, if the building was used for a, a sort of a, a, a large scale event, uh, we've looked at the parking standards for assembly and leisure um, and in the subcategory A dan for, for dances. Um, and when you apply the parking standards calculation to that class use, um, that would suggest that the parking provision should be 51 spaces, which is uh, six more than the current provision. Um, however, as I say, that that was just to try and look at a, a, a different, take a different approach to the to the parking calculation and look at an absolute potential worst case scenario for a, a, a more people generating use. Um, and however, we, we understand that it's not the intention that the building will be used in this way, you know, such as for large scale events such as such as dances or whatever. Um, and, and the building doesn't in fact have an alcohol license. So any any event of that nature would would have to there would have to be an application for for a license um, for that type of event. So on the information available to us, we, we therefore consider that the current parking provision of 45 spaces is in accordance with our Rose Development Guidelines, and in that case was therefore acceptable to us. So therefore, we uh, have no objections to the current application. Chair, thank you. Happy to take any further questions. OK, thanks very much for that, Chair. OK, members, it's over to yourselves. Uh, you know, there's no hearing. You've heard the officer's presentation supplemented by Care for Roads. Uh, so any points of clarity, um, then just ask away. Members, any questions? Any points? No, I'm not seeing any hands. Councillor Todd, Jim. 
Thanks very much, convener. Uh, thanks, Kerr. It's mainly for roads, and, and it was just that safety aspect of coming off the main road. Um, I see there was some objection to um, the safety aspect if the car park was full, where there might be a bottleneck with cars trying to come in and cars trying to get back out because they couldn't get parked. Is the access road wide enough for two cars to pass? And is there a waiting area, if that's not the case, is there a waiting area where a car trying to get in would allow a car to come out? And is there an easy turning circle if a car went in, um, couldn't get parked, they, might, they could get back out safely without reversing? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Todd, yeah, that, I mean, that, that is our concern too, you know, that our, our primary concern is to ensure that the, the, the development has sufficient car parking to ensure that there's no overspill onto to public roads out with the development, particularly, you know, along the A719, which is, is an A-class road, obviously, in proximity to the trunk road. So, um, you know, that that is that is a, a, a primary consideration for, for us, but um, on reviewing it, we 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 are quite satisfied that the 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 layout is is um, appropriate. You know, it is wide enough for two way uh, in and out. There's good circulation space within the development um, to allow vehicles to to manoeuvre and um, and wait up if if required. Um, uh, I'm not aware of um, any any sort of reversing manoeuvres out onto the public road since since the development has been in operation. I, I, I understand there may have been issues during the construction stage, but I'm, I'm not. I don't think that there, there, this has materialised since since the development has been in use. But, but certainly, so that, I mean, as I say, our, our primary concern is is that as well. You know that uh, we do have sufficient capacity to ensure that there there is no. A overspill situation, and as I say, our, our, our applying our standards to that would suggest that that, that, that there should be a appropriate provision. Thanks. Are you okay with that, Jim? Okay. Uh, members, any further questions or points? Okay. We'll move to determination then. Um, members, are you happy to approve? Subject to the conditions laid out in. Page 38, and I think you've got three conditions. One of them has to do, I think it's uh, the first condition is the two metre two meter fence, which was discussed uh, during the, the presentation. Members, are you happy to approve subject to the aforementioned conditions? OK, thanks very much. Um, the next item on the agenda, uh, which is item... Sorry. sorry. Yeah, sorry, Lynn. Thanks, Chair. To confirm members, the decision of the Planning Committee is to approve the application subject to the conditions and for the reasons detailed in the report. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Lynn. That was a big kick. <laughs> Item 4, Planning Application Number 200425PP, Application for Planning Permission for Erection of 10 Numbers, Wind Turbines with a Maximum Height of 180 Metres, and associated infrastructure, including access tracks at Overhill Wind Farm B741 from Armour Wind to U720 Dalricket, Do Mellington, East Ayrshire, pages 41 through 145. Graham. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, councillors. I'll keep the presentation shorter than the committee report itself. Uh, the report obviously sets out all the detail of the case, so I just intend to provide a short overview of the key issues here. So this is an application for overhill wind farm comprising 10 turbines at 180 metres to blade tip height with an installed capacity of 48 megawatts and associated infrastructure, including access tracks. Uh, this slide just shows the application site, which is accessed from the B741 road, and the site itself is located to the west of Newcomlock. This is the proposed layout of the wind farm. There is actually an existing consent on this site for a very similar development under reference 17-0395-PP, and that's for very similar development, as I said, of 10 turbines. However, those turbines are 149.9 metres in height. The applicant has confirmed in this current submission 
that the layout and dimensions of all infrastructure, such as access tracks, construction compound, crane pads, turbine foundations, are all the same of those as those associated with the consented site, which is reflected in the site layout, which is identical. As the infrastructure, with the exception of the actual turbines themselves, would be the same as that the previously consented scheme, then many of the impacts resulting from the proposed development would be the same as those previously assessed and found to be acceptable for the consented development. Impacts such as on hydrology, geology, ecology, traffic, forestry and aviation, amongst others, are not considered to be unacceptably adverse, uh, subject to mitigation. There will be no increased peat loss on the site, which contains an abundance of nationally important peat, as the applicant has confirmed that all infrastructure will remain the same and the applicant is also committing to undertaking the same mitigation in terms of habitat management and peatland restoration and other parts of the site to compensate for the loss of and any damage to this important peatland habitat. As set out in the committee report, uh, consultees such as Nature Scott, SEPA, RSPB, Prestwick Airport and ARA, amongst others, have not raised any objections to the proposed development, although this is subject to mitigation in many cases, which could be secured by conditions. Oakletree Community Council have registered their support for the proposal. There were nine letters of objection received from four different individuals raising concerns regarding the proposed development, which are summarised in the committee report. As noted, much of the proposed development would be the same as that of the consented development, with the exception of the turbines themselves, which are now proposed to be 180 metres in height. And this is an elevation of the proposed candidate turbine. The dimensions would, would be a hub height of 113.5 metres, a rotor diameter of 133 metres and a total blade tip height of 180 metres. As the turbines now exceed 150 metres in height, this triggers a requirement for the turbines to be fitted with visible aviation lighting at both the hub height and on the towers at half the hub height. Further environmental information submitted by the applicant in July comprising an aviation lighting report indicates that due to the layout of the proposed wind farm, it could be possible to reduce the lighting requirements so, so that only seven of the turbines would require hub lights rather than all 10, and only three of the turbines would require tower lighting uh, rather than all 10 of the turbines. Uh, the visible aviation lighting introduces a new impact, which was not a feature of the original consented development, where the turbine light heights were kept below 150 metres specifically to avoid the need for visible aviation lighting, as infrared lighting is acceptable below that threshold. So the key differences between the, between the previously consented scheme and the proposed development are as a result of the scale of the turbines, and that would constitute landscape and visual impacts and residential visual immunity impacts due to the increased scale of the turbines and the requirement for visible aviation safety lighting. There now follows a series of slides showing wire lines and photo montages from a select number of viewpoints to provide a sense of some of the general landscape and visual impacts across the wider area. Some of the photo montages include scaled and cropped versions to fit the, the screen height, as the photo montages themselves contain advice that if viewing the image on a screen, they should be enlarged to fit the full screen height. The slides are all taken from the environmental information and are used for context only in this presentation with the detailed environmental information available to view as, as, as background papers. Uh, so this is just a, zone, a ZTV, a zone of theor theoretical visibility to bleed tip height, uh, which shows that beyond the initial sort of five to 10 kilometre distance, uh, theoretical visibility starts to become more limited, generally in an arc from around about west northwards over to the east, with southerly views generally a lot more limited. Uh, this is a wire line from New Cumnock at Connell Park, which is approximately 9.1 kilometres from the nearest turbine. Uh, this is a photo montage from New Cumnock. And this is a full screen height version showing you the, the overhead wind farm. Uh, this is a photo montage from Ochen Lake, which is approximately 9.3 kilometres from the nearest turbine. And again, this is just a photo montage uh, at full screen height. As as distance um, distance from the from the proposed development increases, 
the general visual impacts start to decrease. This is a low light photomontage intended to give an impression of the turbine lighting from Ochiltree, which is approximately 7.7 .7 kilometres from the nearest turbine. Again, this is the full screen height version. <clears throat> it's worth noting that based on the aviation lighting report received in July 2021, only seven of the turbines would require hub lighting rather than all 10, which was originally shown in the applicant submission. In terms of general landscape and visual impacts, whilst the increased scale of the turbines now proposed would be more prominent and have an increased effect compared to the smaller turbines previously consented, on balance, there are not considered to be any unacceptable landscape and visual impacts on the wider area, and that includes nighttime visual impacts. One, one of the key other key impacts, um, however, is that of um, residential visual, visual immunity. As set out in the committee report, residential visual immunity assessments have to consider whether the effect of a development on residential visual immunity is of such a nature and or magnitude that it potentially affects living conditions or residential immunity. This is, this is termed the residential visual immunity threshold. Such judgments regarding the threshold are made by landscape consultants with any final judgments on residential immunity itself being a planning matter. In this case, the increased scale of the turbines now proposed with the increased rotor diameter and the height combined would be notice, noticeably larger than those of the previously consented smaller scale turbines. Uh, the closest residential property is Upper Beer, which is located approximately 1.7 kilometres from the nearest turbine. And the land owned by the residents in that case is actually located in what is effectively a small island within the application site which surrounds the residential unit. Uh, the following slides show the wireline and daytime and nighttime photomontages from Upper Beer with full screen height photomontages split over two slides due to not being able to fit them onto a single slide at full height. Uh, these are for context only again in this presentation with the detailed environmental information available to view as the background papers. Uh, so this is a comparative wireline which shows the consented 149.9 metre high turbines along the top image and the proposed 180 metre high turbines beneath, whilst it may not be is clear in, you know, in this uh, scaled image on the slide, uh, there is a notable difference in scale between the consented ones and the proposed turbines. Uh, this shows the photomontage from the principal elevation of Upper Beer, which faces out towards the proposed turbines. Uh, this is part of the view showing some of the turbines at full screen height. And this is the second part of the view. Uh, this slide shows the, the low light photomontage from the property with an impression of the aviation lighting. Uh, the turbine second from the right, which highlighting there with the mouse. Uh, that's one of the ones which wouldn't require aviation lighting based on the updated aviation lighting report submitted in July. Again, this is just another slide showing part of the view at full screen height. And again, this is another slide showing the other part of the view. Council's landscape consultants, IFL, considered impacts on residential visual immunity and advised the Council that it is their judgment that the proposed development would exceed the residential visual immunity threshold, which becomes an impact on immunity. The reasons for this include the high magnitude of daytime visual impacts which would be notably greater than those of the consented scheme, which is a result of the increased turbine height and rotor diameter in the swept area as the turbine blades rotate. Uh, the dominant position of the turbines on elevated land relative to the property, where views are orientated towards the proposed development. Uh, the widely experienced views of the turbines from around the property and its cartilage, and it's noted within the committee report, that views would be widely available from the south of the property, extending around to the north and northeast, and also the extension of visual impacts into the hours of darkness due to the noticeable aviation lighting impacts introduced into what is a very dark landscape at present with no direct influence from artificial lighting. 
uh, as discussed within the committee report, visible aviation lighting is also an eye-catching feature in its nature. And this is due to its position on the turbine hubs relative to the blades. As the blades pass behind the light, the light reflects on the, onto the back of the blades, causing a pulsing effect. And whilst there is also a flickering effect when the blades pass in front of the light, these effects wouldn't be uniform and would vary from one turbine to the next when, when viewed in reality. Uh, the Council would agree with the judgment made by Ironside Farah, IFL, and consider the increased scale of the turbines proposed and the resultant increased prominence and dominant effect of the proposed turbines would exert an overbearing impact which would be experienced widely in and around the property and throughout much of its cartilage. The nighttime visual impacts would exacerbate the daytime impacts, resulting in a sense of almost unavoidable visual impacts experienced throughout the daytime and into the nighttime. The resultant impacts on residential amenity are considered to be unacceptable. Um, a separate independent landscape consultant also assessed residential visual amenity impacts and judged these to exceed the residential visual amenity threshold, and their report was submitted to the Council as part of the representation. In terms of financial implications, should the Planning Committee be minded to refuse the application in line with the recommendation, then it could result in an appeal to the Scottish Government's Planning and Environmental Appeals Division, and this would result in financial implications, including potential costs incurred in engaging expert external advice, support or representation in undertaking any appeal. The applicant has so far not agreed the value of the financial guarantee for any decommissioning, restoration and aftercare costs with the Council should consent be granted. However, the applicant has agreed to enter into a Section 75 legal agreement to provide a financial guarantee and the Council would expect negotiations to continue to agree the costs as advised by the Council's independent consultants if this is necessary. So to conclude, in many respects, the proposed development would comply with many of the development plan policies and material considerations, although this is not universal, with some non-compliance with a number of policies due to the unacceptable impacts on residential immunity. It is recognised that Scottish Government energy policy and planning policy provide strong support for, renew for renewable energy development, uh, for which the proposed development would attract uh, strong positive weighting. However, such support is not unequivocal and detailed assessment is required against a range of matters. In this case, despite the positives, the resultant significant adverse impacts on residential immunity, which the Council would attach considerable weight to in weighing up the balance, are such that the positives are not considered to outweigh the impacts on residential immunity of residents living closest to the proposed development. For the reasons set out in the report, it is recommended that the application be refused. Thank you. Thanks very much, Graham. That's a very, a very full and complete report. Okay, members, again, we have no hearing. Uh, so it's open to yourselves in regard to any questions or any clarity required from Graham with respect to his presentation. Members, any comments, thoughts? No. Okay. Just a couple for me. And now I know this. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Tom and then Neil. And then I'll come in. Yep. Thanks, Chair. It's just a point of clarity that the existing planning application is, uh, is still in place of planning permission. So, therefore, if this was refused, they could still go ahead with the, the lower uh, height of, of turbines. Am I correct in that? Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor. Uh, yes, the consent is currently in, in place, and if this was refused, there's, there's nothing stopping them from implementing that consent. OK, thanks very much. David, do you want to come in at this point? I think that's a technically, technically correct answer, but my understanding is clearly that the applicants are of the view, and this isn't buying or selling the application, but the applicants are of the view clearly that the current consent would not be commercially viable. Uh, hence the greater application for the bigger turbines, et cetera, et cetera. And there are other issues. So technically, yes, the current consent is live. And technically, yes, they, they could well implement it. Uh, but I think for balance, and I, I guess it's not to affect the recommendations. I totally support the recommendations. The report's in my name. But on that point, I think it's fair to also balance that with commercially. It may not be the case that they would wish to go forward with this consent, even if technically it would still be live and they could. 
uh, I think the likelihood would be, and again, it is not to impact members' decisions uh, today, but I think the likelihood would be an appeal because that's the project that they think is commercially viable and worth delivering. So I think the likelihood would be an appeal rather than the applicant accepting and implementing the earlier consent purely for commercial reasons. And it's just to give committee that, that rounder balance. But I, I still support the, the recommendations that have been put before you today, Chair, for you. No, thanks for that, David. I mean, there is a bit in the report as well, Graham, that you've got at the start in terms of the commercial viability of the project. Um, Tom, are you OK with that? Yep. Yeah, fine, fine, fine with that. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, Neil? Sorry, Chair. No motion, Mr. Miller. <clears throat> yeah, I'm hearing the same thing about viability, but as, as David said, that's for another consideration. But I, I was going to ask a question about the, the lighting uh, and the candle power of that and how, what real impact it has at different times. And I'm hearing that. Uh, it's a very low density, but, but and I, I'm not an expert, so I'm here. It's 200 candle power, uh, as opposed to 2,000 at the work scenario, which might be the darkest, and it might be three o'clock in the morning. I don't know. But just if, if, if Graham could give an idea of the impact of that, or the lack of that. OK, thanks, Neil. Graham, could you expand on that, please? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, it's, it is a quite a technical one in terms of candela. So, um, essentially, the the turbine lighting uh, would be noticeable, um, whether uh, reduced intensity or not. Uh, there is some mitigation proposed within the lighting units itself, which comprises a form of shielding, which basically sort of attempts to limit the the intensity of the lighting to. To, so, it at, so it's at its highest uh, along the horizon or the horizontal from the, the light itself. And um, with the degree of view um, angled higher and lower from that horizontal plane, uh, the light intensity would reduce. Um, although there is some doubt as to exactly how effective that uh, lighting will be. We've got uh, conflicting um, figures um, from the applicant. Uh, their most up-to-date report indicates the intensity would be higher than what they originally reported to us. Um, but that would do you know that would go some way to reducing some of the intensity, albeit they will still be visible and still be noticeable features and you would still get the flickering and the pulsing effect. Um, when it's there's also potential mitigation in the form of um, when when the weather conditions are clear, you could get reduction in intensity um, down to ten percent of the the standard value. However, again, you know, this it, it's uncertain as to how often that would be the case. The applicant has indicated in the report that good visibility occurs on average over the past 30 years from using data from Prestwick Airport, that this could occur 98% um, of the time. But again, that's from a separate location and that's on an average basis. Therefore, because it's average, there will still be plenty. There will still be other times when it's not reduced due to clear conditions, um, and it will be its at its worst, you know, its maximum intensity. Um, but even with the mitigation proposed, um, our Ironside Farrer and ourselves have considered that, and it would still be a noticeable impact. You would still see them, um, albeit you will get you know, variation in terms of the intensity. Sometimes it will be more intense than others, um, but ultimately that's largely down to weather conditions and potentially the, the turbine lighting unit which is which is installed. Does that help, Neil? I'm sorry, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to yeah. be that well, there's an attempt being made to reduce the impact of that and it's, it could be if we've got a wet sale, it could be 98% of the time reduced lighting. But I understand that there could be it could be higher than that frequently last year. Okay, Neil. Anybody else want to come in? One. Uh, Councillor McFadgen, good morning, John. Glad you're able to join us. Good morning. Can that sort of lighting be shaded from the ground? I mean, presumably that lighting is, you know, for aircraft that are sort of flying towards or above or coming from 
you know, a, a higher altitude than, than the light. Um, so is, is it possible for those lights to be fitted with a kind of a lower shield that extends out to, from the bottom of them that makes them slightly difficult to view from ground level or can the back of the blades where they pass by the lighting be coated in a non-reflective surface, you know, in the bit? Is there any mitigation being used anywhere to try and use the effect of those lights to the ground level viewer or is that too dangerous to obscuring them in any way at all? Thank you. Graham. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, the Civil Aviation Authority will determine what, what lighting units are acceptable to them, and it's in order to meet their requirements in terms of the lighting. Um, that, as, as you've mentioned, in terms of shielding, could it be done uh, to reduce it when viewed from the ground? That's essentially what they're proposing, um, albeit, obviously, it doesn't fully stop you from viewing them from the ground level. It does reduce it to some degree, but you know, it, it doesn't fully uh, reduce the visibility. You will still see uh, these lights from the ground level, and that is that, that is just the nature of the, the turbine lights at the moment, even with um, sh shielding installed as mitigation. So basically what we're saying is um, it's dependent on what caveats the Civil Aviation Authority put in place. Would that be correct? Uh, yes, but essentially I think the, the units that are available just now and the, the position at the moment is the hub lights and the mitigation detailed in the report are effectively what, what is in force at, at this time and that, that doesn't fully eliminate any uh, visual impacts from when viewing from the ground. Okay, thanks. John, do you have a supplementary? No, okay, okay. Councillor Todd. Councillor Todd, Jim. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, yeah, I understand uh, what's been proposed. Um, I, I'm of a mind to support the recommendation because, um, and I know it's progress and I know there's new innovations in industry, but planning application, the original one was already accepted and um, for uh, the original proposal. And are we in a scenario where um, through a period of time, people come back developers come back to change things that have already been agreed, where do we stop? And uh, I think the officer has uh, outlined exactly the impact on residents. I think there's uh, quite a few uh, residents around that area that are already going to have an impact on them. Um, why raise it further? Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong. I think it's reasonable uh, that the, the plan and application has been accepted in its original form. And I don't see any reason why uh, we should accept this one. So I'll, I'll be going for the recommendations. Thank you. OK, thanks very much for that, Jim. Anybody else want to come in? OK, we'll get the uh, Billy and John McFadgen and then Neil McGee. Thanks, yeah. Just as Jim Todd said there, that's the way I feel. We've had two years of COVID and I can't get away for the thing. And we're getting other things about mental health and other things that worries folk. This is another thing. Another point about it is why would we uh, employ a specialist team at Ironside Fire, which safeguarded this before, uh, and I would be supporting the recommendation. Okay, thanks, Billy. John? I would just say, um, yes, I would support the recommendations along with Councillor Crawford and Councillor Todd as well. OK, Neil. Thanks, Jay. I guess you're different. You're talking a bit funnier today, isn't it? Um, I, I, two or three things, Jay. I, I, I think I have some sympathy for the, the applicant. I think it's only one application. It's really funny there, just for a second or two. Okay. Councillor McFadgen, can you put your microphone in mute, please? John, can you put your microphone in mute, please? Okay, thanks. Neil? Thank you. I think 
The objection is from one individual household, I'm led to believe, which is fine, and I, and I have some sympathy for the impact on them. But I'm more concerned about the greater impact. And and if these are, as David mentioned earlier, the whole thing could collapse, and he said, ah, but if these larger turbine tips are there too, it, it could provide renewable energy for 11,000 houses. And, and at a time when the world's going on fire and, and flooding, I just don't get the balance of that. And, and as again, I have a sympathy for the applicant, but the, mate, the screening could be done at a closer. I'm not know, I'm know to put ideas in his head, that's for him to decide. But I'm, de I'm definitely uh, opposed to the recommendations. I would support the approved fair plan. OK, thanks very much, Neil. Um, I think a couple of comments from myself at this at this juncture. Um, I think Ironside Farah have uh, served as well in the past. And if you look at um, the comments in paragraph 154, um, they're pretty concise in regard to what they see as the disbenefits. And then if you go on to paragraph uh, 386, the, the Hepler report, um, Concludes that the proposed overhaul development result in the major effect of upper beak, which is considered significant. The respective cumulative effect is also judged that there will be major cumulative effect on upper beak, which the Hepler report considers to be significant. Now, I think as Councillor Crawford has advocated, there's no point in us bringing in consultants if we're going to ignore what they're actually saying to us. Um, we've judged this against the local development plan as well. And I think you make a fair and relevant point as well, Neil, in what you're saying. But there's also an argument if you take a step back as to when the original proposal came before planning, then the applicant would have done a business case at that particular point in time. So the project was viable at that point in time. So I don't really see now what has changed too much to alter that. Yes, we are seeing bigger and bigger turbines coming forward within East Ayrshire. But that's something that we need to do, you know, through the planning service and look at the pros and cons. But I think for me, I would be supporting Councillor Todd on this in regard to going with the officer's recommendations. Members, anybody else, any further points? Councillor McGee, do you want back in? Bigger target, Sorry. I think I'm all, I'm all right. Can you hear me? Right. I, I mean, bigger turbines mean fewer turbines, so there's a there's a plus side of that. Too. But if the if the market and the energy market saying you need that amount of power to make this viable, then I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm just on the side of the the many, and and if we can make the world a cleaner place and a better place, then I'm up for that, Chair. Thanks. Thanks for that, Neil. OK, members, are you, ha you happy to move, uh, sorry, to go to determination of a proposal for Councillor Todd, seconded by, I think it was Councillor Crawford. Billy, was it you or was it John? Crawford. Councillor Crawford, sorry. Um, and we have a counter proposal from Councillor McGee. Um, do you have a seconder, Neil? Nope, I don't think so. The idea is... No, I'm just I'm just looking at the screen. I don't, I don't see anybody. Um, does Councillor McGee have a, a a seconder for his proposal? No, I'm not seeing I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, so I think that that motion by yourself, Neil, it falls. Um, so members, would be happy to approve, subject to the conditions, the recommendations for approval. Are on page 142. Sorry, ref, ref, refusal. I beg your pardon. Uh, refusal 142 and 143. Okay, Lynn. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Members, before I confirm the decision, Councillor McGee, do you wish your dissent recorded within the minute in terms of your fail to record a seconder? Ah, uh, if you would, Lynn, please. Thank. You. Yep, thank you, Councillor McGee. Members, the decision of the Planning Committee is to refuse the application for the reasons detailed in the report. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks very much for uh, that, Lynn. Uh, the last item on the agenda is the planning application number 210155, 
AMCWP application to discharge supplementary condition number 5A, uh, revised TMP, uh, school times of permission number 21-0065 AMCPP at Snedden Law Wind Farm U41, Hemp Hill to High Russia, Moscow by Mr. Rhys Thompson, Community Wind Power Limited, pages 146 through 155 on your papers. David. Hey, thanks, Chair. Uh, morning, members. Um, the purpose of this report is to present an application for the discharge of a planning condition relating to the approved traffic management plan for the Snedden's Law Wind Farm. Um, the application comes before committee as committee in agreeing to approve application 210065 AMCPP requested that the future applications to discharge conditions relating to revisions of the traffic management plan approved by that consent be brought back for planning committee for determination. Um, the site description is set out paragraphs three and four of the papers um, with background information relating to the imposition of the condition and the full condition wording uh, found at paragraphs five and six. Uh, the applicant's proposals uh, are set out at paragraphs seven and eight. Uh, noting in particular that the applicant has included in the revised TMB, uh, TMP uh, an embargo uh, on HGV movements passing two schools, uh, which is Hurlford Primary and Loudoun Academy, at school pick-up and drop-off times. Uh, this affects the applicant's southern stone route um, with no schools on the northern stone supply route, so there's no changes to that um, element. Uh, the details also include how this will be enforced by the applicant. A consultation response from ARA is set out at paragraph 9, noting no objection to the application. The assessment of the revised TMP is set out at paragraphs 11 to 18 of the report, noting that this application is essentially narrow in scope, focused on the st stone supply HGVs passing schools, and not the wider TMP, which is almost identical to that previously approved by committee. The assessment finds compliance with policy T1 of the LDP, and the material considerations do not indicate that the application should be refused, noting in particular the ARA consultation response and the particular planning history of the site. Uh, there are no financial or legal implications should committee approve the application, as set out paragraphs 19 to 22. However, if committee refuse the application, there are potential financial implications arising from any appeal that may be made. The conclusion at paragraph 36 highlights that the applicant has identified schools on the stone transport route and has advanced mitigation to reduce impacts uh, as required by the planning condition. Having assessed these proposals, the development is considered to be compliant with the development plan and the material considerations do not indicate that the application should be refused. The, the recommendation is therefore that the application be approved as per paragraph two um, and supplementary condition 5A be discharged on that basis. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much for that, David. Um, might be worth bringing care in uh, in terms of the uh, the Roads Alliance position, paragraph nine, um, and also enforcement and monitoring what's actually going on. Care. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, just to confirm again, Chair, that we, we are certainly happy to support this application um, and to reduce the potential conflicts um, around the schools. That you know that 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 will certainly be a benefit to to the local communities. Um, it's important that this, the details of this are, are included within the traffic management plan and, and the appropriate transport protocols are put in place um, with the applicant and their um, contractors and and um, uh, and hauliers um, to ensure that the the the, the, the embargo periods are adhered to. So um, it's something that we will be keeping a close eye on in terms of monitoring um, once once the these activities take place. Chair, thanks. OK, thanks for that elaboration, Care Members, do you have any, any points, questions at all? Yes, Councillor Mayor George. Thanks, Chair. It was just uh, a, a point I was wondering about, the fact that they're, they're going to be constricted and the times that they're allowed to, to run. Does that mean that they're going to be having maybe convoys? I think it's only, is it only four for an hour, but I'm concerned that because of the constricted time that they might start running, you know, two and three and four lorries at a time. Is, is that uh, mitigated against or, or uh, is that a likely scenario? Thank you. 
Okay, uh, can you uh, come on? Yeah, yeah. Th th thanks, Chair. Um, as David noted in his presentation, that, that you know there are two um, quarries sources for the stone. So you know, wh whilst the, 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 the short embargo time periods for the Sorn quarry coming through a uh, Hurlford and past Loudon Academy, there's there's no such restrictions for the Floak quarry com coming down from the E77 and E719. So there is there is the scope there for the applicant to to balance their, their deliveries between the, the two uh, quarry sources. Um, so I, would, I wouldn't en envisage that there would be a particular uh, impact on, on, on how, the, how the, 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 the stone imports would operate in practice. Is that okay, George? Does yeah, that answer that's your fine, query? thank you. Okay, I'll bring David Wilson at this point. David? Hey, thanks, Chair. Um, it was just to reinforce um, what Kerr had said there. Um, I have spoken to the applicant and their intention is just to manage it via the northern route. They have the flexibility because of the nature of where their quarries are that this um, embargo, whilst it, it has to be managed on their part, I don't think it's difficult for them to manage because of the nature of where their quarries are and where their site is in the middle of it. So I, I don't envisage it being a particular problem in terms of convoys because they have the alternative to rely on. Um, so during those times, they would expect to use the, the alternative northern route um, just to, to make sure that the supply continues without any impact on the schools. OK, thanks, David. Um, George, back in. Yeah, just a supplementary. Does, does that mean that there might be convoys coming through uh, Moscow and Waterside from the north, or are they going to are they going to manage that? Thanks. Uh, okay, yourself, David, is it yourself or care? And I think it, it's again it's down to good monitoring, but we'll hear what the David and Care's got to say. Uh, no, I, I don't anticipate that um, happening. It's just about them managing where the stone comes from. Um, they've only got a certain amount of supply anyway and, and what they can take in at any single time. So it would essentially just be managed in their part that the supply continues on a, a reasonably decent flow, um, but that they would make sure that during those times where there might be a chance of vehicles passing the schools, that those vehicles are not coming from Sorn, but instead they're coming from the northern route. Um, we are talking here at one or two vehicles at the most during those times, so I don't really anticipate any likelihood of convoys um, really taking place at all, but Kerr can perhaps elaborate on, on that. Kerr, can you provide a bit of assurance? Yeah, thank you, Chair. No, I, I think I would endorse what, what David has, has said there to members. I mean, members are aware that there, the Sorn quarry, um, there's, there is al already um, a restrictions on on um, convoys you know the, the, the they have to come out at, 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 at stages intervals um, and we would like we obviously be monitoring that from the float quarry as well to ensure there was no no convoys taking place and as David says then the, the numbers as they are sh should uh, allow for them to, to del deliver stone without the need for any convoying. Thanks chair. Okay thanks um, Tom. Sorry, thank you. Tom Cook, and then I've got Ellen Frio. Tom? Chair, yeah, sorry, my hand's not up as far as I know. <laughs> sorry, Ellen. I just wanted to ask um, who's going to be monitoring it, that these speed checks are, are kept in place. I know that buses often arrive early at schools, earlier than the school closure. And so there will be traffic maybe out with those times. Who's going to monitor the whole traffic situation? Kea, yeah. do you want to respond to that? Um, I, 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 David may wish to also comment on this, Chair, but I mean, ultimately, planning enforcement ha have a responsibility for monitoring purposes. Um, you know, we would also be happy to undertake um, spot checks, um, you know, at, at, uh, at the schools to ensure that there was no um, quarry traffic um, coming in at those times. And, and if, we, if there was any observed breaches of that, that would be taken up with the 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 site manager uh, through the construction traffic management plan to 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 rectify any 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 breaches if if they did so arise. Councillor Field. 
I think the key here is going to be good monitoring uh, based on the questions that's been asked. Um, but I'll bring David in and then I'll bring Craig in. Chair, through you, just, just to offer some comfort, obviously the normal approach will be that we would be looking in the first instance to the applicant to adhere to the terms of any consent and any discharge and any conditioning around the traffic. Members have heard that the anticipated volumes won't generate convoys and you've heard as well that the normal approach will be uh, adopted, which is should we receive reports that the applicant or the developer are not adhering to their conditions? And members can be assured for this application and this development, we will receive reports that they're not adhering to it. Whether or not they're accurate is a different matter, but the public or anyone else who's concerned that they're not adhering to it complain, and then it becomes a planning enforcement issue. Uh, and we'll have Tom Dickey out there. I anticipate we'll have Tom Dickey out there anyway because of the context of this one. But uh, the, the, it's, it's not standing watching every operation at the side of the road, but planning enforcement will kick in. So should it be reported that they're not adhering to these rules or conditions, then we will deal with that in conjunction with planning and indeed the schools, because the schools will be able to tell us quite quickly if these lorries are going by when they shouldn't be. And, and that's the normal the normal approach. And I think we can be quite comforted that if the developer should stray off the path, even once, we will be advised of it and we will deal with it as we have done for the last 10 years, even though it's not started yet. OK, thanks, David. David, do you want to throw anything else in? I can't really add an awful lot more to that, Chair. I think that's that's completely accurate. Just as a bit of comfort, the applicant's obviously aware of the responsibilities they have set out in the, the document itself that they'll put this into their stone contracts so that it's set out at an early stage of what's expected. And they'll also provide briefings um, to their drivers and contractors. So they are already putting in place the the avoidance element of this hopefully and I'm quite sure that they would um, react if, if it was brought to their attention that there was breaches but I'd endorse entirely what David says we, we would obviously um, investigate and be on top of any complaints that we got. Okay thanks for that David. Hey George, Ellen are you satisfied with the responses? Okay thanks. Anybody else want to come in Lynn? No. no. no? OK, members, the recommendations uh, are in front of you uh, for approval. Are you happy to approve? OK, yeah. thanks very much. Lynn? Yeah, thank you, Chair. To confirm, members, the application has been approved for the reasons detailed in the report. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Lynn. OK, folks, that concludes today's business. Uh, just a big thank you to everybody uh, for your attendance and input in today's meeting. And uh, have a good weekend. Take care. Thanks all. Bye. I take care.